Hey guys, Chris here. In this video, we're gonna talk about five important things I wish I knew before I went out and bought my first electric car about a year ago. So if you're gonna buy your first brand new electric car, these are five important things you should know about before you go out and purchase one. And even though you've had an electric car for a few years and you just wanna learn more about electric cars, you may want to watch this video also. And guys, if you're new to the channel, I'm Chris, I have this channel dedicated to testing EVs. I do all kinds of testing. So if you like EV stuff, be sure to drop a like, a thumbs up on the video down below. That is much appreciated, so thank you very much. And before we kick off today's video, a huge thanks to the video sponsor of today's video, Saptec with their Saptec Go home charger. The Saptec Go is a small, stylish, and elegant home charger that can be had in a bunch of different colors. So I'm going to link it in the description box down below. So if you're looking to buy a home charger, please check out the Saptec Go linked down below. Battery capacity is measured in something called kilowatt hours. Not kilowatts, not watts, kilowatt hours, which is a measurement of capacity. Yes, there is another term in battery or EVs called kilowatts. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And kilowatts does sound very close to kilowatt hours because it's basically the same without the hours added to the end. But there is a difference and it can be confusing. Yes, even me find myself, you know, from time to time uh, misspeaking and saying kilowatts when I'm in kilowatt hours or kilowatt hours when I mean kilowatts. It's not very dangerous uh, as long as you understand how the different terms apply. And that's what we're going to go through in today's video. So battery capacity, kilowatt hours. And then you have gross battery capacity and net battery capacity. So gross is the actual whole physical battery pack while net is the available energy from zero to 100% in the gauge here. So what is actually available to use. And then you have something called a buffer below zero. And I would never recommend anybody going down to zero and not below zero. But if you have to, if you're in a pinch and there's no charger, most EVs actually have a buffer of, I don't know, five, 10, maybe even 15 kilometers below zero, depending on driving conditions and also outside temperature and all that other stuff. So some EVs will actually let you go down to zero and then a little bit beyond just to get to that charging station. So take this battery pack again, which is 64 kilowatt hours gross, 61 kilowatt hours net, there is a small buffer below zero. So the actual net net, the actual available battery capacity is a little bit more than 61 kilowatt hours, but from zero to hundred percent, it is 61 kilowatt hours. Another reason not to go down to zero percent, you risk bricking the battery. So if you drain the battery physical of all this energy down to its actual zero percent, you know, beyond that b bottom buffer and what is programmed by the car or not programmed by the car, you may actually destroy and ruin the battery. If you go down to its physical 0%, the battery will be bricked. You can't charge it again. It's, it's trash, it's worthless. You can't use it. So be careful. Some EVs don't actually have this buffer below zero. Zero is zero. And when you're out of juice, you're out of juice. The battery pack is ruined. And also performance is severely reduced closer to zero you go. So most EVs will have, you know, most of its power down to like 30 or 20%, but then below like 20%, you really do start losing power. And then below 10%, most EVs have, I don't know, maybe 20 or 15% of its peak power left. And that may go down to as low as only a few percent close to zero. So if you're on a motorway, don't go below 10 in most EVs because you won't actually have any power. When it comes to charging, you have two main different types of charging, AC slow charging or DC fast charging. Those are the two different types. It's simple, slow and fast. So AC charging or slow charging is your typical home charger and speeds will vary from about one kilowatt to 22 kilowatts. Today, there isn't a car that can charge faster than 22 kilowatts at an AC charger that I'm aware of and typically, Chargers aren't slower than one kilowatts, but you can, well, you, you, you can find a charger that is slower, typically your wall socket, but most chargers between one and 22 kilowatts. So the charging speed will be dictated by the socket, by the charging box, by the speed dictated on the label of where you're connecting to. 
but also by the car. So cars have something called onboard chargers because while connecting to a wall socket or a charging box, it's not actually a charger like a fast charger. The charger is in the car, therefore the term onboard charger. So take this Polestar 2, has an 11 kilowatt onboard charger, meaning that it can charge at a maximum rate of 11 kilowatts, even though it would be connected to a 22 kilowatt charger. And there we have that term again, kilowatt, and then we have kilowatt hours. Sound very similar, can be confusing, and I'm going to try to explain to you guys how they relate. So say this car could charge at a rate of 22 kilowatts, and the battery pack was 22 kilowatt hours. That means zero to 100% charge could happen in one hour. That's how kilowatts and kilowatt hours relates. So another example was if this car had a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack, we connected to a 100 kilowatt charger, that full charge from zero to 100% would take half an hour in theory. But more about that later on in the video. And also for battery health, you don't wanna go past 80 or 90% in most EVs because going to 100% will severely reduce the capacity over time of your battery pack. So to keep it healthy, you don't want to go past 80% and also going past 80% often is slow, but more about that in the charging speed section of this video. So the more you charge, the quicker you charge the battery, the less healthy it is for the battery and the more capacity you lose over time. Then we have DC fast charging, which is from 50 kilowatts all the way up to, well, 350 kilowatts are the fastest chargers I'm aware of now in 2021, but no EV charges at 350 kilowatts. The fastest charging production car today is the Taycan slash e-tron GT. Peaking at like 273 is the best measurements I've had out of one of those cars, which is still super, super flat. But then we're talking about something called charging curve. Like I said, with AC charging, giving you the examples of kilowatt and kilowatt hours, you know, from zero to 100%, the time it takes, it's not that simple because EVs have something called a charging curve. I'm going to overlay one here. As you can see from this Polestar 2 single motor standard range, you can see that the peak speed is faster the lower we are in the battery percentage and then we get up to a certain percent and then it starts tapering off as the battery gets fuller and fuller. And this is just the nature of how battery works because most EVs will charge at between something called two and three C. So again, you take that battery capacity, you multiply it by two to get two C. So this car 61 kilowatt hours, multiplied by two, you get 122 kilowatt hours. That's your peak charging speed, 122 kilowatts at 2C. Some EVs may charge even faster, but that's your typical range. And that's why also the charging speed tapers as the battery gets fuller because the available capacity actually gets less. So that's how it works. But then you have something like an Audi e-tron 55, which has a super flat charging curve, which will do like 150 kilowatts all the way up to like 79% and still go fast above that. That is because it's actual top buffer the available capacity above 100% is quite substantial. So the battery isn't actually, or the yeah, the charge, the battery actually isn't charging to its physical 100%. So this is how manufacturers manipulate the battery capacity to give you slower charging, faster charging, safe driving below zero and, and stuff like that. So it is quite complicated and does take some time to comprehend, but this is why some EVs charge fast above 100, no, it's 80%, and some charge slow above 80% and vice versa. But not only do we have a charging curve dictating how fast a car will charge, you also have heat. Heat is very important. So a cold battery will charge slow. A warm battery will charge, well, it can charge slow if it is too warm, but if it's at its peak uh, charging temperature, it's going to get that peak charging curve. You're gonna get that best result possible. So some EVs do this differently, like this Polestar 2 with its latest uh, software update, the OTA P1.7, it got preheating while navigating to a charger. That means the battery will use some of its energy to heat up the battery, so when it gets to the charger, it will be at its optimal charging speed to get that fast charging. And this really does make a difference because before you know these uh, updates, you would 
almost get half your charging speed. So not in this, but the long range dual motor that peaks at 150 kilowatts, you would get 150 kilowatts navigating to a charger, giving the car enough time to heat up the battery. But if it was like now, like 10 degrees outside, you didn't pre the battery, you would be lucky to get like 80 kilowatts. So that really does help. And also lastly, what I do want to mention is like, charging etiquette or charging, I don't know, customs, whatever you want to call it. So this Polestar 2 has a peak speed of 115 kilowatts. This being the standard range, single motor, 61 kilowatt hour battery pack, peak speed of 116 or 115 kilowatts. That means I'm not going to go to a 150 kilowatt charger with this. I'm not going to go to a 200 kilowatt charger. I'm not going to go to a 350 kilowatt charger because that means I am occupying a charger that somebody else can use. I'm going to go to the fastest available charging speed charger for my battery pack. And also that's down low. If I'm at like 70%, I'm not going to go to that 100 or 125 kilowatt charger. I'm going to go to a 50 kilowatt charger. So if we all, you know, follow these same rules or uh, etiquettes or whatever you want to call it, customs, we will all be charging quicker. We will be using the chargers and charging network more efficiently, meaning that we will all be on our way quicker. Because if I occupied a 200 kilowatt charger, I wouldn't be charging quicker. Everybody else who could use that charger would be charging slower, meaning that everybody would be moving slower. Then we have a juicy one that maybe a lot of people actually find the most important, and that is range. And range can be very, very misleading, but it also depends on where you live, what is the road you drive on? What is the weather? And there are so many determining factors. So you have three different types of measuring of an EV's range. That is the NEDC, the old standard we used in Europe, which is just totally, totally useless. I mean, it's so inaccurate that it's not useful for anything. This car is now rated at the WLTP range, which is the thing we replaced the NEDC with here in Europe, but it's still not very, very accurate. But this has a WLTP range of like 444. The NEDC range of this would probably be like 600 kilometers, which is just, it's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense at all. And then the last one you have is the EPA, which is the one they use in the United States, which is all, often the most accurate. Uh, because of the testing procedure. So these all of these tests are done at different speeds, different inclinations, and all of that. So some are realistic, some are very unrealistic, like the NEDC. But the WLTP seems to be the closest to actual range. But not always, because it is done in key up. So take like the Porsche Taycan or Audi e-tron GT, which gets a fairly poor EPA range because that car can be put into efficiency mode or to range mode where it lowers on the suspension, goes into two, two wheel drive and gets much more range. That is not measured by the EPA. So there the WLTP range of like 470 is much closer to its actual, actual range. But this is why I also do the test, which is the motorway range test, where I do uh, a test at 110 kilometers an hour because that's like uh, motorway speeds for a lot of people and worst case for a lot of people. There, the EVs I test typically get something between 60 and 70% of their WLTP rated range. But also, it's not as simple as that either because temperature is a huge factor, wind direction is a huge factor, uh, weather, like is it rainy, is it sunny, dry, all those things will dictate how much range you will actually get out of an EV. Then we have something that not a lot of people talk about, but what I find quite interesting, and that is consumption. So let's take this car as an example again, because while well, I'm sitting in it, I'm currently testing this car. And guys, if you want to watch more of my videos, there will be a link to, well, a few cool videos I have done down below in the description box. And also, if you're new here, please consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. That is much appreciated. So thank you very much. But back to consumption. So let's use this car as an example. So say you're going on a stretch of road and the consumption is 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. You're thinking, okay, battery pack, 61 kilowatt hours. You're gonna, you know, just calculate in your head how far you actually can go because you're not always able to trust the trip computer or the gasometer or even the navigation. You wanna do your own calculations, you have your own safety buffer. So you're gonna take the battery capacity, 61 kilowatt hours, you're gonna divide it by the consumption and then you're gonna get out a number, in this case, 305 kilometers. That's gonna be your range, but it's not that easy because what you have with a battery is something called heat loss. So 
you know, drawing the juice out of the battery and all the, the drain on the battery will generate heat. That heat is just lost into the air. And typically that will be somewhere in between one to 5% depending on the EV. And for some reason, the, the trip computer, the GOM does not calculate that. And that is very annoying because in a combustion engine car, the actual fuel being pumped out, which is, you know, goes into propelling the car forward, but is also combusted into, well, to fumes and to heat and to gas is also part of that consumption number. So, uh, uh, you know, this car or an electric motor with this battery pack and stuff like that has between one and 3% heat loss. A combustion engine car has something like 70, maybe 75% heat loss. But all of that is calculated into the consumption, but not in an EV. So that is something I find important to note and something you should know about. Then lastly, and this may be more important than range, charging speed, and all of that good stuff we talked about in this video to a lot of people, and that is charging infrastructure. I'm very lucky. I live in Norway. We have the best charging infrastructure in the world. I mean, I don't think there's a country even close to the charging infrastructure we have here. So my test, my opinions on cars are reliant on that. Like you don't need a Tesla in Norway to be able to go anywhere. But in a lot of countries, Tesla is your only option because of the supercharger charging network, supercharger charging network that Tesla have built out around the world. So maybe a Polestar 2 if you live, I don't know, in the middle of America, say you live in, I don't know, Colorado. Shout out to my friend Kyle from Fort Collins, Colorado. A Polestar 2 or another EV that uses, you know, the CCS charging plug, which this car uses, may not be an option because you just don't have chargers. So depending on where you live, you may want to be looking at charging infrastructure before you look at something else. But also, if you're not going far trips, charging infrastructure may not be as important. But that is, you know, something you have to find out for yourself, depending on where you live. Again, I live in Norway. We have much more CCS, you know, non-Tesla superchargers than Tesla superchargers. So owning a non-Tesla is not a disadvantage at all. And with this car, for example, with this latest OTA, giving it preheating to a you know DC fast charger, something a Tesla doesn't have, it only has preheating to a supercharger. You could argue that this car actually has an advantage in some ways to that car. So I don't know, it really depends on where you live. So charging infrastructure, definitely a must know before buying an EV. So there we go, guys. Those are the five things I find important to tell you guys about before you go out and buy an EV. Is there anything I missed? If so, I do apologize. And if I made any mistakes, well, I didn't mean to make any mistakes. Or if I misspoke, again, I do apologize. But is there anything else you guys want me to make a video about that you think is important to know before buying an EV? But these are things that I was able to think about that like, yeah, these are five important things to know about before you buy an EV. So guys, I really do hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please drop me a thumbs up down below. And for more car content, as always, guys, please subscribe. See you guys later and goodbye.